Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Renee Rogers. I am the head curator here at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. And tonight you have joined us for a conversation with Henry Horenstein. Um, um, welcome, first of all. We're very, very glad to have you here, and we appreciate you spending time with us tonight. Um, I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's finally gotten a little cold where we live. So it's kind of nice to be inside and doing something a bit cozy, like hearing Henry talk about his work and his photography. Um, just a few things to note before we um, move forward with the program. If you don't mind, please mute your mic and, and disable your video during the conversation part of this program. And that's simply because that way the, the camera won't be shifting back and forth between other people and it will focus fully on um, the conversation between myself and Henry. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the conversation. So please write your questions for Henry in the chat or in the comments for the Facebook Live platform and we will then get to those at the end and be sure that your questions are answered. Um, so be thinking up some good ones for him because I know that Henry is very happy to answer them. Um, just a very quick introduction to Henry Hornstein before we move into the conversation part of the program. Um, we are talking to him because right now the museum has his special exhibit, Honky Tonk, Portraits of Country Music, 1972 to 1981 on display in our special exhibits gallery. This is an exhibit that we have been, that we have been working to have at our museum for all at least four years is, um, is when I first talked to Henry was probably back in 2016. Um, and it's been on our schedule since then. So we've been really anticipating having it here and it's been open at the museum for a little over a month now. Um, it will be on display at the museum through March 28th, 2021. So if you are in our area or are going to be in our area, please make time to come see it. You will not regret it. It's a wonderful exhibit. And if you aren't able to be near us, um, especially in the days that we're living in right now, um, don't fret because we will be posting soon a virtual highlight tour of the exhibit so that people who aren't able to make it to the museum at least get an introduction to the exhibit. But first, let me introduce you to Henry Hornstein. Henry has been a professional photographer, a filmmaker, a teacher, and an author since the 1970s. He studied history at the University of Chicago and earned his BFA and MFA at the Rhode Island School of Design, where he studied with Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskind. Henry's work is collected and exhibited internationally, and he's published over 30 books, including several monographs of his own work, such as Histories, Show, Honky Tonk, Animalia, Humans, Racing Days, Close Relations, and many others. He has also authored Black and White Photography, Digital Photography, and Beyond Basic Photography, which are, which are books used by hundreds of thousands of college, university, high school, and art school students as their introduction to the art and craft of photography. His, his book, Shoot What You Love, serves both as a memoir and a personal history of photography over the past 50 years. In recent years, Henry has been making films, including the films Preacher, Murray, Spoke, Partners, and Blito Underground, which will premiere this coming fall in 2021. Henry is a professor of photography at the Rhode Island School of Design and lives in Boston. Welcome, Henry. We're glad to have you here. Oh, you're muted right now. There you Thank go. you. It took a while, but we're here and it's great. Yes. And, and tonight we're going to have a conversation together to just to give people an insight into your career and into the life, the life you've led behind the lens. So um, let's jump straight in. And first off, some of the earliest work that you did in photography, some of it was done with Rounder Records, which was a, a sort of an upstart bluegrass label. And you were doing like album photography and um, PR photography for them. So if you can tell us a little bit about your early work with Rounder Records. Was this, was that your first photography job or had you done some other work before then? 
Well, um, in those days, I don't know if we'd call it a job as a mission. Um, they were, the rounder people were just starting out, as I was, uh, in what I was doing. And they lived across the street from me in uh, Boston, near Boston. And, um, but I had known them ahead of time, a couple of them. One, one went to University of Chicago and studied history when I was there. Bill Nowlin, and another one, Ken Irwin, and I went to basketball camp together, which he remembered, but I didn't, uh, when we were like 12 years old. And so we knew each other, you know, a little bit, and um, they didn't have any money, and um, I started hanging out, going to shows. I loved the music anyway, so um, that, that was a good connection without the work even, but, um, and I just started taking pictures randomly. Sometimes they'd call me, sometimes I'd just show up and take some pictures and they'd use them or they wouldn't, uh, depending. And uh, for me, it was a great way to gain access to this world because I wasn't a musician. I wasn't a, uh, I didn't have a record company. <laughs> um, I did serve as um uh, photo editor for a magazine called Mule Skinner News. Mm -hmm. Some of you may remember it. I don't know. It was a small magazine edited by uh, Fred Bartenstein, who was, I think, who showed up at, um, you know, at our last uh, talk. He showed up somewhere recently, but he's in Ohio. He's a uh, terrific uh, disc jockey and uh, singer and uh, promoter of bluegrass music anyway. So I did kind of have these tenuous connections, but mainly for me, they allowed me access to people to photograph. Don Sturbert's a great example. And Don is one of my favorite people I ever met in country music, maybe anywhere. Um, he was, I'll just tell you a real quick story about meeting him before I took this picture. Uh, there was a place in downtown Boston called the Hillbilly Ranch in the 60s and 70s, and uh, a band called the Lilly Brothers from West Virginia, from around Beckley, uh, was the house band there for 17 years. And Don Stover was their banjo player. And, uh, and but in those days, it was kind of the hippies and the redneck and the, you know, kind of battles. And uh, we were students, I guess we were the hippies. And, uh, but we loved the music, my, my friends and me. And we would go to the Hillbilly Ranch and sometimes be harassed by some of the regular customers. And one day I was in there uh, one night and uh, we were getting a little feedback from the local, uh, the regulars. <laughs> and uh, Don was on stage and he, I didn't know him, you know, uh, I just knew his music. Uh, but he noticed what was going on and he stopped the set after the song. And he said, going to take a little break now. And he walked over to our table and he loudly said, how are you guys doing? Let me buy you a beer. You know, good to see you again. You know, you're always welcome here, blah, blah, blah. And from then on, we were golden. You know, <laughs> he's such a sensitive guy, you know. Plus, I'm sure he wanted the customers and the fans. But, um, but I got to know him a little bit and he was something very special. And then um, he, it was the cover of the first edition of my book, Honky Tongue. And uh, I sent a copy. To, he had like eight or nine kids. And I sent um, a copy. I found uh, the address for one of his kids, one of his daughters. And I sent her a copy. And she, she gave me a call. In those days, you called. And she said, um, she thanked me for the book. And she started crying. And I said, Don had passed on by then. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, when we were kids, you know, we thought our dad was, I mean, frankly, we thought he was a bit of a deadbeat. You know, uh, my mother, our mothers took care of us, worked and took care of us all. And dad was on the road or away at night. And we had no idea what she, he was doing. And we didn't like the music very much. We would listen to rock and roll, you know, and um then in the last year uh, in Owensboro, we went down, the children went down to Owensboro where dad was indicted, inducted into the Bluegrass Hall of Fame. Uh, and now we get a book with his picture on the cover representing a whole era of this music. And she said, and she just cried. She couldn't 
you know, believe it. Mm. It's a sweet story. But well, it's, it's, it's nice that you had a special moment with her dad and then were able to give a special moment to her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a sweet guy, really. And uh, I don't really know her. We just had the phone call. But mm. Well, from Rounder Records, I mean, how long, how long did you do work for them? Well, it was very uh, sporadic. You know, it was off and on. I'd get a call or... Mm -hmm. um, I often saw them, you know, just at shows. They used to have, um, you know, set up little booths at the um, at bluegrass festivals and and concerts with their with their records. They went on and did really well. Did beautiful work. Alison Krauss was their discovery, and she recorded for them for a long time. Yeah. A lot of her records were for around her. Um, very smart, smart guys. Chris Stapleton and. Mm. Oh, they discovered a lot of people went on to great, great things. And when did you, how did you start branching out into your own photography? So beyond the, the, the more creative work as opposed to the, the work for, for a paycheck? Well, it was, <laughs> it was barely a paycheck, but it was a paycheck. <laughs> that said, uh, you know, my life and career has mostly been a, uh, from, for the paycheck about teaching. I'm a teacher, and that's how I make my li most of my living. And, um, and I do a lot of other things, personal projects and commercial work and whatever comes my way on top of that. Um, but, um, you know, gamblers say, I hope I break even. I can use the money. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of the way it is and what I do and a lot of people like me do, I think. You know, musicians, I imagine, would say the same thing, mm -hmm. a lot of them. Um, but um, I was never a music photographer, per se. I was in a show out in California, in L.A., three or four years ago called They, Shoot, they Shot Country Music. And there were 10 photographers, wonderful photographers, uh, whose work I knew. But most of them were really music photographers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they did in their careers. For me, I had a period of time where I did this body of work. And occasionally I did some other things over the years, yeah. but um, with music, but really I've photographed racetrack, horse racing. I've photographed uh, burlesque. I photographed um, animals. I photographed a lot of things over the years and, you know, um, and music is, uh, is really one of them. Right. Well, how about telling us a little bit about your process as a photographer? I mean, do, do you do your own developing? Do you use any spe specific techniques? What are, what are you sort of working at when you're doing that? You know, when I, uh, my students, um, you know, they just like, just think they're bad dad jokes, you know, when I say it. But, <laughs> um, but it's true that what they do as students is kind of what I do. And, and uh, when I say me, I mean, People do the kind of work I do um, in that we, and, and again, musicians some, to some degree too, but um, we come up with ideas just like students do, you know, to do a project. They have a theme, they have a project they want to do. They have to come up with the idea. We, you know, teachers help them maybe, but they have to come up with their own idea and they have to work on it and have to complete it and package it, put it in a presentable form and, you know, and that's it. And, that's what I do, you know, and, and still do. Um, all day I was spending putting pictures together for a project I'm hoping to get published. But um, so that's in terms of darkroom, um, I shoot all digital now, but uh, I was a little late to the table. Um, I took my last film pictures in 2014. Okay. I can tell you, I know, because of the files right over there. Um, <laughs> And around, um, and I was shooting hybrid till then, and now I shoot all digital for obvious reasons. Uh, but I have a dark room, and when I need a print from the old days, I, I, I make a print still. Mm -hmm. um, but if I didn't have a dark room, I don't know if I could do that. Right, yeah. All the prints, uh, you know, that I do, from the old days are usually darkroom prints, usually darkroom prints. Okay. And mostly done by yourself? Not anymore. Used to be. 
Yeah. But now I'm an assistant of the prince. Yeah. Well, going on to the exhibit that's at the museum, um, the honky tonk exhibit. I mean, the images in that, there, there are a whole variety of different types of images. I mean, you have the iconic country stars, you know, people that are instantly recognizable. You've got the people who are their fans, the people who are there to see them play, um, or the people who are just on the periphery of it even, um, but also the venues. And to me, the honky tonk sort of idea behind the, the title of the, of the exhibit. And then some of those venues are just so classic for that. But most of all, I think, especially with the pic, the pictures with people in they're they're very intimate. They're very expressive. They're not posed mostly. I mean, unless, unless it's like one of the pictures that has come forth from the round rounder records album cover type days, but they're not posed. So I guess when you're, when you're um, looking at your subjects, be them a pe- be they a people, or a place, what are you trying to bring out um, when you focus in on these portraits and these stories? What are you aiming to tell with them? Well, you know, um, Mother Maybell. <laughs> I, just, I, went, I went forward too quick. Sorry about that. I was so happy that I got to photograph her. Well, and some other people too, but particularly Mother Maybell. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, well, I, my point of view is... I guess, I guess I feel that everybody's got their own point of view, you know, and it's based on who they are and what they're comfortable with. To me, this series of pictures are, you know, that you have up and are in the book um, are definitely about country music, no doubt. Um, but even more for me, because I studied history and I always think about history and I still read history and, you know, watch documentaries and I'm still interested in that side of the world because histories like early country music um, are stories. Mm -hmm. They're narratives, they're troubadours coming and telling you about a train wreck or telling you about a murder or telling you about even romance in a uh, narrative kind of way. And, And to me, these pictures, which were mostly taken in the 70s, are about country music then, yes, but they're also about who we were as, as a people, as a culture, as a, you know, and the places are a big part of that. I mean, I didn't intend to go when I was shooting. I wasn't interested particularly in the big stars mm. at the time. You know, I was more interested in the everyday people who I wanted to document and kind of preserve that sounds really pretentious, and I'm sorry, but that was in my mind at the time. I got a very clear sense of it. I wanted these people not to be forgotten because they were such an important part of who we were in in the country, but you know specifically in whatever area we you know I was photographing and um so that was my goal. Fortunately, I did photograph some people who were well known. Thank God. <laughs> But it wasn't my intent, and I would have, you know, kind of dismissed it at the time. But I had a chance to meet Dolly Parton and Porter Wagoner and Jerry Lee Lewis and, you know, Mother Maybell and um, people like that. And of all those, um, those people, unless you love country music, Dolly's probably the only one you've heard of, and maybe Jerry Lee. And um, But... Um, so I wasn't looking so much for that as I was, but in, I ended up with kind of a history of country music. It's not a, it's not a thorough one or a full one by any means. You know, it's not an academic one. It's probably not even accurate. But um, you know, in this little film clip that Eddie, Eddie Stubbs of the Grand Ole Opry uh, did a little, talked about my pictures a little in this film clip, uh, and at the end of it, he says, you know. Um, a photograph, no matter who took it, is a piece of history that will never, never come again, never happen again. Yeah. And, uh, and I listen to that and I'm like, he's singing my song. I mean, that's exactly how I, how I feel about it. Yeah, and for anyone who's um, listening in right now or, or watching, if you go to the museum's website at birthplaceofcountrymusic.org, to the exhibits page where we have the exhibit page about honky tonk we have that video that that henry just mentioned the eddie stubbs video so go have a look at that yeah. um just digging a little bit deeper into the places i mean i think again for people who haven't seen the exhibit yet um or 
or haven't looked at seen your book, um, which is still available, I think. I mean, I know we're selling it in our store, but I think it's available more widely than that too. Um, when you think of a honky tonk, you think of the South or Texas, but a lot of these places that you were taking pictures of where people were enjoying this music and, and making it possible for those iconic country stars to have and bluegrass stars to have a career were not your typical idea of where a honky tonk would be. And I think that's also quite interesting. Absolutely. In fact, um, in Boston in the seventies, when I was taking these pictures, there were seven honky tonks that featured live country music in center Boston. And the reason for that, a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a tradition of country music, particularly in Maine and in rural parts of New England, um, the country, they go back, um, you know, from the beginning, you know, from the beginning of recorded country music. For that matter, New Bedford, where I grew up, was a whaling city. The whalers came through there and sang the whaling songs. And they have a lot to do with what, you know, we later called folk music, I guess. Mm -hmm. But uh, Hank Williams was built, built as a folk singer quite often. So, um, so there was a connection all the way through, I think. But the Hillbilly Ranch, Nashville North, there were several honky-tonks in Boston. And the reason for that was after the Korean War, after World War II, I don't know, maybe Vietnam, just barely at that point, um, after all these wars, people came from all over the country, went to the military, did their uh, tour of duty, and went back home. But they lived in small towns in, you know, West Virginia or uh, Virginia or Tennessee, or and there was no work for them. So in order to get work, they'd go to the cities, and a lot of the cities were northern cities. Mm -hmm. So Boston had the Quincy Shipyard, where they made the ships for you know, the, a few wars, many wars that we were in, big wars like World War II. Um, and they had the Charlestown Naval Yard. These were huge employers of people that came from all over, including places that, where they brought their music with them. And that's why the Lilly Brothers, who are in the uh, Bluegrass Hall of Fame um, fr uh, from West Virginia, but their, almost their entire career was in Boston because they couldn't make a living playing music in Beckley, West Virginia, yeah. but they could in Boston. So in a lot of Detroit and Chicago and uh, places like that, Dayton mm -hmm. had a lot, of, a lot of country music. And then there were also these, um, the country music parks, which I hadn't heard of before this yeah. exhibit. Um, oh, yeah. Can you yeah, explain big deal. Exactly what those are? Yeah, there's still one, still one survives in New England that I know of. There may be more. The Indian Ranch, it's called. <laughs> um, it's in central Massachusetts on the Connecticut border. Uh, but there used to be a whole bunch of them. And what they were, were they were a circuit that the country musicians would play. I mean, people like Johnny Cash and Porter and Dolly. And I saw Webb Pierce there and, um, you know, all the Fer Ferlin Husky and... Uh, uh, Jim Reeves and, you know, all, all these, Ernest Tubb, all these people played these. So they would go out on the road and um, they would tour New England. Maybe they came from the Grand Ole Opry or the Wheeling, West Virginia, WWVA uh, Jamboree or one of those places. And during the week, they'd go, go out and play. And maybe on weekends, if they weren't playing the Opry, they would play in the, you know, do a tour of, clubs, honky-tonks in New England, say, and then on Saturday and Sunday, they'd play a country music park. Mm -hmm. And there were Maryland, they were Northeast or um, Ohio had a bunch of them, New York State, including Western New York State, mm -hmm. and in the Atlantic area, Maryland and Delaware and places like that. We had the Lone Star Ranch in New Hampshire, which yeah. I went to almost every week. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Sunday, and they were kind of like you go for the weekend and you put down, you know, your camper and, and there'd be a, uh, a lake there for the kids, uh, a bar for the men. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, and on Sunday afternoon, there'd be country music. Right. There'd be music, but it was almost always country music. Yeah. I mean, I guess we have the festival culture today and um, 
Yeah. I think one of my colleagues said something about today. Now you can go on those country music cruises <laughs> where there's several country music stores and yeah. you're on the cruise. And, yeah. yeah. Bluegrass cruises too. I want to go on one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't been able to go on one yet, but yeah, the festival's kind of, I don't know if it took it over. I think the festival crowd's a little different than the the music parks, but no, you'd you'd have a mix of people at these places. They were uh, interesting places. The Indian Ranch in Webster, Massachusetts, still has shows that the as the demographics, the audiences change. They now have some '80s rock bands come in. <laughs> Charlie Daniels used to play there every every year. Uh, Sammy Kershaw. I saw Tanya Tucker there. George Jones always played there at the Indian Ranch. Um, he always got the biggest crowd um, <laughs> when he showed. He always showed. <laughs> well, let's let's have a look at some of the pictures um, that are both from the exhibit, but also some of the ones that are from your book, um, but part of the same theme. And just if you could talk us through just sort of the context and any of the stories or what you were trying to show the viewer with the image, that would be really great. Sure. This is this is one of my favorites, obviously, since Maybell Carter is so important to our content at the museum. But um, it's just a great picture, all in all. Well, that's one of her daughters there on accordion, and um, in the background is this woman. I wish I remember her name, but she was she and her husband were front of the house band at the uh, at the Lone Star Ranch. A lot of those places were uh, run or owned by uh, musicians. You know, the, the Lone Star Ranch would be typical. I've, I can't remember his name, but he had a short career as a musician. He recorded for Decca, mm -hmm. and then he came back home and he uh, set up this music park. And it got, it got him some work, too, because he got to play, uh, you know, in the shows. And, the, and then he got, you know, to meet and uh, feature and get to know the uh, little Jimmy Dickens and people like that, you know. And Mother Maybell, I didn't really talk to her much. I made a nice picture with her. Um, but um, she was elderly then. She was still out on the road. And mm -hmm. uh, her daughter was married to Johnny Cash still by then. But um, I've just read, you know, things about her. And she and the, the daughter said they'd like to go on. The, you'd know more about her than I do, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but like, would go on the road. To, just to keep her company, because otherwise she would have got on her own. And... Uh, is that true or? Well, I know, I mean, I know she was still certainly in the seventies um, and well, in the sixties and the seventies was playing a lot still, especially with um, some of the, the folk revival folks um, yeah. and so, like the Newport folk festival and places like that. And um, she still performed with her daughters. And I know that Johnny Cash would have her on the Johnny Cash show. Um, right. But yeah, I think, I think she, we have some pictures in our collection of her when she came down and, and played with Sarah at the um, AP Carter Memorial Festival at the Carter Fold down here. Um, I've never been to that. I got to go. Yeah. That's still active aside from the yep, they, they still have that. Still have it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, the first, <laughs> uh, yeah. The first time I saw Mother Maybell Carter was at a folk uh, festival at the University of Chicago Folk Festival, uh, which is still active. And I saw a lot of these people there, um, but they, their main careers were over mm. and they were, you know, trailing. But Don Reno, people like that, I, I saw it uh, in Chicago. Yeah, and I can't remember which daughter played the accordion, if it was Anita or Helen, but um, no, I do Helen. remember a story about when she first picked up the accordion, when she was first playing it, she played it upside down by accident and another musician had to tell her that she was playing it upside down. So well, they could play anyway, I think, you yeah, know, I mean, to the, <laughs> she was still fine with that. <laughs> Anita was at the show, the show, she was with her uh, mom and her sister. Uh, and I have a nice picture of her um, alone that I don't think made the book. I don't know why. I think she had the most beautiful voice of all of them. She had an incredible voice. I uh, think, yeah. Think. Yeah. Well, our next picture, this is again, I really, this one is not in the exhibit, it's in the book. Um, a couple dancing at Buck Owens Crystal Palace in Bakersfield, California. And this is a more recent picture, not a 1970s to 80 picture. So, but it feels, it still has that feel to it, certainly. 
Yeah, I try to keep it consistent. I, in the second, I did two editions of the book, and in the first edition, it was only 70s, 1970s pictures. And then the second edition, I added a few that I took later, and this was one. Um, I really wanted to photograph Buck Owens. Uh, uh, I knew I was going to do the book, and I wanted, you know, to get, and I, I did photograph him, but I didn't get a picture that I liked too much. But he had a, um, and I think it's still active, Crystal Palace, um, a club, more of a supper club, I guess you'd say. Uh, um, and I contacted them and they said, well, Buck's sick. He's not well, but he still performs on weekends. But um, the deal they had was because he didn't know if he was well enough to perform. They charged $5 entry. That's mm -hmm. it. And they always, they had music all night. Sometimes Buck would show up if he could, and he did if he could. Uh, sometimes he'd play one set, and, and uh, but he wasn't well, and I didn't get a good picture of him, unfortunately. But I like this picture quite a lot, and this is, you know, one thing I really like about country music is you can go out and, and any age and dance. You see that more in Texas, I think, than any place where you'd see, you know, old and young, two stepping around. And, yeah. uh, and I really liked that part of, uh, part of it. Anyway, uh, there was, uh, <laughs> um, he made a little museum, a lot that attached to the, which by the way, had the best steak I've ever had in my life. A museum? <laughs> at the, no, no, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> at the, it's, it's set up like a, a supper theater or dinner theater. Oh, okay. you know? And yeah. I had an amazing steak, which I was surprised. I surprised it was so good. It was expensive, too. But anyway, um, so he had a little museum attached to it, and he had a nudie, uh, nudie suit that he had designed for him with uh, silver dollars. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, uh, sewed in. And he said he only wore it once because it was 60 pounds, and he thought it was going to kill him. Jeez, so please, he yeah. wore it once and put it up in the museum. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> well, I just, I just love this picture because you really feel like you're watching this very special moment between this couple. Um, it's so, it's so wonderful. By the way, I'm paying attention. Someone just wrote me. So I'm writing, writing him back, but I'm listening. Yeah. <laughs> I love it too. I mean, this couple, this older couple and they appear to be into each other still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And probably way better dancers than most most of most young people. I'm sure they look good. I tell you, they yeah. and they did, and you know they were um, they weren't two stepping so much, but at least they weren't line dancing. That's a yeah. good <laughs> now. This is one that we do have in the um, the exhibit, the Wayland Jennings at Performance Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and it just. I mean, it feels like it's quintessential. I mean, I think I see, yeah, some beer cans in the background, the cigarette. <laughs> yeah, Waylon, <laughs> you know, I, you asked me about process and so forth. And, I, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of photographers I know, um, they feel they have to spend a lot of time with their subjects and, um, you know, and get to know them and get some empathy going or, you know, and um, I don't necessarily feel that way, you know, because I'm a, I knew who he was as much as I needed to. I didn't need him to be my best friend. Yeah. Uh, and um, I knew his music and um, I, I, I knew what I wanted. I wanted all that stuff. I wanted the, the bottles. I should probably have a Lone Star beer back there or whatever, <laughs> but he probably drank something a little... Uh, more upscale, but anyway, <laughs> and that's uh, a friend of mine uh, and the bottom right, the bottom right. And I just went in and, you know, he just, you know, wasn't that interested in me <laughs> either. Uh, I mean, I was interested in him, but he was like, it's his job to get a picture made. And, uh, but I'll tell you, years later, I have a good friend from um, Littlefield, Texas, which is not far from Lubbock. I thought... Uh, when I actually went out there, it turns out it was about 40 or 50 miles from Lubbock. And I called my friend Richard. I said, Richard, 
you didn't grow up next to Lubbock. It's 40 or 50 miles away. He said, Henry, this is West Texas we're talking about. And that's right next door. So anyway, I went out there. I went to Littlefield because I was in Lubbock. And my friend Richard, I, I, uh, uh, who had, whose dad had delivered Wayland's first child. So I thought that he was the only doctor in the area at the time, I guess. Anyway, Richard, uh, I had to go to Littlefield, get my picture made with a sign that said Littlefield. And uh, I turned the corner and I saw this uh, building, kind of ramshackle building, and it said Wayland Jennings Museum and Liquor Store. <laughs> so I got a nice picture of his first cousin who runs the museum. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, that's not quite the museum that we have, but it sounds exciting. <laughs> I know. Now, this one, um, Tootsie, at closing time at Tootsie's Orchid, Orchid Lounge in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, that's that's probably one of my favorite stories that's told in one of the exhibit labels in the, the museum about how she got rid of people at the end of the night, um, which I'm sure was probably not that easy to do at the end of the night. No, supposedly Charlie Pride gave her that. Uh, I don't know if he gave her the... Uh, there's a hat pin, I guess, that she sticks people with to get them out. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, Tootsie's Orchid Lounge was one of those pla- is one of those places that I thought would disappear. And I was determined to uh, um, preserve it. But now if you go to Nashville, there's a Tootsie's in the Nashville airport. And uh, you can barely get into the place unless you go like at 10 in the morning. It's packed all the time. So um, I was completely wrong about that. But I do have a good Tootsie story, however. That's, uh, I used to go in when I could and, um, and photograph there. And uh, that's the thing about, you know, honky-tonks or bars that when people start drinking and it gets late, they either get hostile or they're your best friends. <laughs> and so they could be a great place to, um, to get pictures or not, depending mm-hmm. And um, so anyway, um, this is a piece of trivia that maybe, um, maybe I'm inaccurate about it, but I think I'm right. Until the 70s, late 70s even, printed T-shirts were not that common. So now, of course, every bar, every restaurant, every place you go, I'm sure the birthplace of country music has T-shirts that they sell as merchandise. Um, so... Um, but they weren't that common, and Tootsie did not have T-shirts in 1974 when I was in there, three, four, five, the years I went. And um, I had been, I had a small, small business with a couple of friends of mine from art schools where we made T-shirts and we made silkscreen things, you know, for posters and so forth. And um I went back home. I said, you know, Tootsie's doesn't have a T-shirt. We ought to try to make a T-shirt for them. And they said, that's great, you know. And I had a picture of Tootsie. And so we put her picture on the uh, T-shirt and said underneath Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, you know, and sent it down to her and said, are you interested in buying, a, you know, this T-shirt? We, You know, I guess there was some monetary concern, but mostly we thought it would be really cool mm-hmm. to do Tootsie's T-shirt. And um, so I even have one here, maybe. Um, uh, I'm going to look and see. <laughs> um, so I, we got a phone call back from Tootsie herself. And she said, um, you know, I like this idea. I think we should do it. He said, she said, but I don't like the picture of me, which shattered me because I wanted my picture. She said, I'll send you up another picture and, you know, and let's do it. How much of the shirts? And I don't re- remember the real numbers, but I'll tell you, um, um, let's say it's $5 for t- to her, whatever. And so I said, well, $5 each. And she said, oh, good. Okay, send me 100, 100 shirts, you know. And, uh, and we said, okay. And I got off the phone. I was really excited. And I told my partners. And they said, it's going to cost us like $150 to get the shirts. Where are we going to come up with that? You know, and um, I was like, oh, no. And I said, they said, well, you're going to have to get a deposit from her. And I thought, well, I can't ask for a deposit from the great Tootsie. You know, it was embarrassing. 
Uh, and they said, you got to get it. We don't have the money. So I called up and uh, I, I brought it up. And she said, oh, yeah, no problem. She said, how much is that again? I told her. And she, I said, if you can get, you know, a third or a half here, that'd be fine. And so she got my address. And a couple of days later in an envelope, we got an envelope packed with beer stain ones <laughs> and two and fives, the full amount and paid in full, you know, wow. ahead of time. And uh, from then on, she got credit from us. <laughs> <laughs> she ordered a few times and uh, now they've got a really nicer shirt. But we had the first. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Here we have D. Ford Bailey backstage at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, One sec. I want to see if I got this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I do. Yep. This is not the one that I did or we did. It's the one that we did eventually she bought and used. But can you see it? I know with that background makes it hard. I know. Yeah, it's hard to see it with the background. Yeah. Oh, it comes through every once in a while. Yeah, if you move away a bit. There you go. If I move away, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, I pulled it out because it's the only one remaining, and I'm going to do a Kickstarter. Can I advertise the Kickstarter in, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the winter, spring? And I thought I'd put that up and see. <laughs> that would be, well... Know when you do <laughs> millions of people wanting that i bet there is actually <laughs> maybe we'll see uh the uh anthony deluxe should i wait on the uh questions till the end or the chat yeah. line yeah we'll come back to the questions at the end okay. so everyone can um be in a bit anthony <laughs> yeah, we'll, be, we'll be we'll be there soon um we have d ford bailey here i mean a, a great harmonica player yeah, he he was only there that one time. Uh, well, he was there, I think, in the 30s. Does that sound right? Maybe originally? Um, a little bit later than that. But later um, 40s, maybe? Or, yeah. Um, and he was not there for a whole long time, I don't think. And he was the first black, as far as we know, you know, as far as I know, black artist. But there might have been a, others at the time, but... Um, he left and he he had a shoe shine stand in Nashville, I think, the rest of his life. But they had a an anniversary for the Opry and they brought him, maybe it was the 50th anniversary, something like that. They brought him back and I got a picture of him with Roy Acuff and a couple of other people. But I thought he stood on his own, you know. Yeah. And again, I, I like the sort of behind the scenes look that we're getting there. It's, it's nice to see that and not just be a, again, a very posed photograph. Um, it doesn't have that feel to it, which is nice. Well, now if you go to the opera, you've got, you know, two or three guards on either side of you helping <laughs> you point your camera. You know? sure. Yeah, <laughs> With very specific views that you're allowed to have. Exactly. Yeah. The reason why I chose this one, um, because I don't know very much about Gene Riley myself, um, but I just thought, and I'm assuming this is the tour bus. Yes, yeah. Uh, I heard it's it's crazy it. that um, the walls, <laughs> I just thought it was so, had such a 70s feel to it that oh, yeah. I had yeah. to choose it. She was, um, The Girl Most Likely was one of her hit songs, uh, but Harper Valley PTA was the, yes. was her big hit. And, um, which I remember. I'm sorry, I do remember that one. Yeah, that would Tom T. Hall wrote it. And, uh, there's a podcast that some people may know. Uh, I think it's Rhinestone and Cocaine and Rhinestones or something like that. Um, um, David Allen Coe's son has this podcast, it's very good. And there's a whole uh episode on Jeannie C. Riley. And that in that song, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, she was in New Bedford. Well, it's Westport, but uh, New Bedford, my hometown, is right next to Westport. And uh, she was at an amusement park called Lincoln Park that we used to go to as a kid. And she was there to do a show. And uh, and I got in and took the picture. I mean, in those days, you could just talk your way in. <laughs> and she, she had had that was a number one hit, and I think. She had a couple of other top 10 hits and kind of, I think she went to um, religious music after that. Which a lot of country stars make that transition. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, I think she had, I don't know. I don't know her, but just what you hear about her. She's a good singer. And her song, you know, she was a pretty woman and she used to wear very high skirts and very high boots, <laughs> which was very not in fashion among the women singers of the day, you know, yeah. country singers. So she stood out. <laughs> And um, Dale Watson, he's been um, here with us at the festival before. Oh, good, um, yeah. Continental Club in Austin, Texas. Again, another later picture than the 1970s one. But again, I just, I loved this one just because of the feel of being right there in the audience when you're looking at it. Yeah, this and all the beer in the front. <laughs> he's a spokesperson for Lone Star Beer. So there's often a lot of uh, beer bottles <laughs> around him. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, Dale's like old school honky tonk singer, you know, truck driving singer even. Um, and, uh, and he, he dances every dance. I mean, he must play a show every night, I swear, you know, and I don't really know him. I did interview him though for a movie I did called Spoke about the broken spoke in Austin. And, um, you know, he's a good interview. He's a smart guy. And, um, Good songwriter, I think. Great singer. Yeah. Let's see. You mentioned sure. Jerry Lee Lewis earlier, and again, this this is a picture that's full of personality. <laughs> um, yeah, Jerry Lee. I mean, this is a you know, I don't know. Are we okay uh, time wise? Yep, we're, uh, we're good. Or am I talking too much? No, no, no. Uh, we've got time. We got time. Uh, so, uh, Jerry Lee. You know, those of you who know his career, he had his rock and roll hits and then he, um, but he was a country singer before that. His, um, his, his cousins were Mickey Gilly and, um, what's his name? Uh, the, the Reverend. Well, anyway, uh, one of the mega church reverends and, um, and so he came from a family of uh, musicians, piano players, all of them. And um, anyway, so then he went on. He had a lot of country western hits. Uh, however, he is not in the Country Music Hall of Fame, which is, you know, shocking. I learned that. I saw a show last year with Linda Gale Lewis, his sister, his younger sister, and uh she was playing with Robbie Folks, this country folk kind of singer guy. I don't, I'm sure a lot of your people know him and some may not, but they were doing the show together. And Robbie had a, uh, I don't know if we can say this, but of this town <laughs> about Nashville, that is his kind of, was his signature song at one time. And Linda Gale said, yeah, she said, and I'll stop singing it when they put my brother in the Hall of Fame, you know. And uh, and I was surprised he wasn't in the, you know, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but not the Country Music Hall of Fame. Anyway, he, uh, I was doing this for a magazine called Country Music Magazine. Some people may remember that was a wonderful magazine that actually started the careers of a lot of um a lot of good writers and uh, also some photographers, but people like Nick Toshis and um, Peter Gorolnik was an early writer for the uh, for Country Music Magazine. Um, anyway, so um, I did this picture for them and he was playing at the Ramada Inn in Boston, which is near the airport, just an ordinary place, you know. And uh, although, you know, people kind of say he was down and out relative to what he was doing in, uh, you know, when he was a rock and roll star, that may be true, but the place was packed and it was an expensive ticket, you know, which was like about 10 bucks. But in those days for his audience, which was a, you know, blue collar audience, 10 bucks, 10 bucks for the wife, <laughs> maybe the kids, maybe have a dinner and, you know, you could rack up probably a hundred, 200 bucks for the night. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was a, a big night out, particularly, <laughs> sorry, particularly for people who were working people. And um, Jerry Lee came on stage, I remember, he had, and he had a big band, like eight or nine people. Linda Gale was with him. And uh, and they came on stage and um, they started playing. They played a song, then they played half a song, and he stopped. And he said, 
you either come out to hear me or you come out to talk. And he and his entourage walked off the stage. No word. And yeah. it was like, everyone was like, what, what can we do with that? You know? And then um, no announcement, no nothing. I was like, I figured I, I was supposed to meet him between sets. And I figured that was off, you know, <laughs> and um, his manager came down an hour later and said to me, Jerry, you'll see him now. And I didn't know if I wanted to see him, to be honest, because it was so weird. Yeah. And I went up and he was there and they were partying him and his entourage had some friends there and they were partying and Jerry Lee, you know, come on in killer to me. And he said, you know, he set up the picture, he posed, you know, it was mm -hmm. the easiest picture I ever made. And I walked out and waited another half hour and he came down with his entourage, his band, and he played for over two hours, the second set, and no one said a word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were scared to death, too. Oh, I know, I know. Well, at least he gave them a show to remember. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and let me tell you just a quick story that Linda Gale told. Uh, maybe people have heard her say this before, but because uh, he has a reputation as kind of being a bad boy. And... Um, she said that when she was growing up, they lived very poor. They, you know, they, they uh, all lived, she explained how they lived, but not well by any means. And she said that when um, he became, you know, when he had his hit records and he was making money, he was traveling, touring, and he called up and he said, uh, he told his mother that he bought, bought them a home. So get ready to move because they were moving to their own home, you know, a nice home and everything. And, and then he called again. He said, no, I want you to go and get, uh, get yourself a car to his mother. And I talked, you know, just go and get one, pick one out and mm -hmm. have him call his manager or whatever. And, uh, we'll pay for it. And, uh, so he called again. He said, you get your car mom. And he said, she said, yeah. He said, what'd you get a Ford or Chevrolet Mercury? And she said, no, I got a Cadillac. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, Linda Gale said that uh, every year he sent her a new Cadillac. Wow. <laughs> after that. So, good, good son. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I think we've got one more picture, which is uh, appropriate as the, the ending picture on this part of the conversation. It's um, people leaving the Opry at the end of the night in, in 1972. Uh, yeah, um, Eddie Stubbs was talking about that. I thought, you know, he's so smart. I mean, if you have a chance to listen to anything he says, you know, um, he knows so much about this history, but he also has, I mean, he knows the people, but he also has the perspective and understands how everything fits into our culture, you know, and, uh, and he's saying, you know, they're looking at the crowds in those days, they were people who, um, had often saved most of their lives for a ticket to the Grand Ole Opera, you know, and it was such a thing for them to to go. Today, it's not the same, obviously, but but they were poor people for the most part, and they they um, you know so and it's such a serious crowd. But also, he points out the way that people look, they dress, they had their hair, all of that stuff describes a lot about our culture then, which was you know what I was kind of getting at. Mm. and not as articulate as Eddie in <laughs> saying. <laughs> we, we've got about 10 more minutes before we're going to turn over some questions. Um, so I guess I just have a, a few questions about some of your favorites or things that you might have missed out on. But did you have a personal favorite of all the pictures you took for this book mm -hmm. and for this exhibit? Is there one that really stood out to you for the subject or for the story or whatever? Yeah, I... Um, you know, I'll, even though it's, I always go back to the Dolly Parton picture um, because I like the picture a lot. And of course I love Dolly, um, but I don't know if it's the best picture I ever took, but it's one that really resonates with people and has continued uh, to resonate. Of course, I like that, that people, you know, she's my greatest hit <laughs> in a way, you know. Well, she's, and, called, uh, she's called Saint Dolly down here, so. Uh, oh, she should be. Is there anything <laughs> higher than Saint? <laughs> she could be the first Pope. Who knows, you know? Yeah. 
if it was a popular contest, she'd definitely win. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, everything about her, and you know that. And uh, I also, I didn't photograph her, but I photographed um, in Branson, Missouri, quite a bit in the 90s. And uh, she had a place there. I think she also has one in North Carolina. Um, but um, I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was a dinner theater with, that basically was horse tricks and cowboys and, you know, and uh, trick riding and so forth. And you got barbecue. Mm -hmm. At that time, they didn't serve alcohol at all. I don't know if, you know, it was called, um, maybe someone knows, uh, but... Uh, maybe, do you know, Renee? I don't know what's well, we, we have We have this Dolly Stampede here in Gatlinburg, Dixie Tennessee. Um, yeah, it was called Dixie Stampede. Maybe they dropped the Dixie part. They have, they have dropped the Dixie, the controversy yeah. and everything, yeah. but um, it was called Dixie Stampede then. But it was similar. They had one in near you, is it? Near yeah, in Gatlinburg. So oh, in Gatlinburg. Right near where she grew up. Yeah. Um, and was born. Yeah. I did know that. And uh, I forgot that. But We're actually, it's in Pigeon Forge, which is on Pigeon the Forge. right beside of Gatlinburg. Well, she had one in Branson. I don't know if she still has it there, um, but she had it, one in Branson, Missouri as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But they said I interviewed, uh, she wasn't there. She didn't perform there, um, but she had a cast and people who worked for her. But they said that every year towards the holidays, she'd come up and say hello to everybody. And she'd remember people, maybe someone was feeding her names, I don't know. But she thought, she was considered enough to think of that and asked about the children and asked about the, you know, the people were like St. Dolly, you know. Uh, <laughs> yep. But she gave me the best creative, you know, being uh, a photographer, artist, and teacher, um, particularly the teaching side, the academic side, people really like to talk about what makes a good picture and what art is and blah, 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 um, so forth and how to, how to do it. But Dolly gave me the best advice ever of all the talks I've had to sit through, all the Zoom meetings I've had in the last year. Uh, Dolly Parton gave me the number one best advice, which was um, I asked her why she dressed and presented herself the way she did. And she said, People don't come out to see me looking like them. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's great advice for a creative life. Yeah. That you want to be different. You want to, you know, um, plow your own field, you know. And, um, and I remember saying that very, you know, and that was 1972. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, there's so many people who I think have a Dolly story like that, where she said something that really resonated with them and that they still carry with them. I mean, there's so many um, interviews where you hear something like that. I think yeah. she is pretty special. And for anyone who hasn't done so, be sure and listen to Dolly Parton's America, the podcast. It is well worth it. Yeah. Um, Very special uh, woman. Yes. Well, Let's talk just a little bit before we finish about, you know, you mentioned some of your other projects that you've done in the past and some of the other subjects you focused on. And so I've pulled up, I pulled up some um, shots from about four of them. And this one is from Animalia or Animalia. Um, I love this one because I'm an animal lover and I, I used to every year when I lived in England, go to the wildlife photographer of the year exhibit every single year and see it. So when I, I spent a lot of time on this part of your website. <laughs> uh, good, good. Well, um, you know, this was my midlife crisis work. <laughs> I'd spent like 20 or 30 years doing documentary photography, um, which basically, you know, like honky tonk going out in the world and photographing what's there and, She's be photographing people and having adventures. It can be very fun. It can also be dreary and sometimes even dangerous um, and frustrating because you have to talk people into working with you. Who are you? You know, mm -hmm. that's why working for Rounder was so great because I didn't have to explain myself. And, um, and sometimes, you know, and a lot of times I'm doing it, uh, most of my projects are self-funded. So, if I go to Vero Beach, which I remember doing, to photograph the Los Angeles Dodgers in spring training one year, and I was going to shoot for a day, and uh, it rained for a week. 
So I was stuck in a motel, which I had to pay for, <laughs> but also just wasting my time basically for a week until the weather. That kind of thing was driving me nuts. And I had an assignment uh, for a children's book uh, re- required me going to zoos to photograph. So I started uh, photographing and I liked the pictures and I like animals too, a lot. And, um, and I got some interest in the work and it was the first time I really had a lot of um, gallery shows and museum shows with this work because it's, um, you know, with country music, the first time I tried to pitch that book, Honky Tonk, I, I went to uh, um, a publisher in New York City and I said, and I presented the work and everything. And the, the editor said, people who listen to that kind of music don't buy books. I got that comment more than once, or similar comments, you know. And so I was, I was discouraged about museums and galleries, felt the same way. It wasn't until Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, uh, and the CD sold tens of millions of copies, I think 20 million more or less, of the day with no, with no commercial airplay that um, people suddenly stood up and said, yeah, you know, maybe they are literate <laughs> and they just like this music and maybe there's something to it. And then I got the book published. Mm. But, um, but with animals, it's a subject that a lot of people can relate to. Mm. And I love the fact that it's um, uh, 20 prints are in the Children's Museum, Children's um, Hospital in University of Pittsburgh mm. and um, eight large prints or of uh, sea, ma- sea animals uh, at the Baltimore Aquarium. Uh, they were there for years. I think it might have just come down, but but and but they're also at uh, museums all over the all over the country in the world, as a matter of fact. And I've done four books, and it was a postage stamp in England. Wow. Um, it had legs, you know, yeah. and I loved doing it. It was very relaxing. Um, if I was a spiritual person, which I'm not, I'd say that it was spiritual, <laughs> you know. But um, but the experience was very different. But I started having a hankering to get back to the documentary work. I'd had my, you know, I'd had my um, affair, and I'd bought my sports car, and I'd like I wanted to go back to life. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I love that your midlife crisis was animals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'll probably be my midlife crisis too. I'll probably end up with like 50 cats or something. But uh oh, well, that would be <laughs> trouble. <laughs> and this one also I really liked just because, again, you get a real feeling for the people from the pictures that you took in Cuba. Um, I especially like the one of the three, the three boys up there because I feel like there's so many different stories that might have been being told there. Well, this is interest, very interesting that you picked this. To me, it's interesting because it's work I did 20 years ago, and I didn't really look at it very much. Um, the reason is because that was when Clinton, was Clinton president then? It was around the time when Clinton lifted the um, restrictions to going right. to Cuba. And a lot of Americans and American photographers went to Cuba Mm-hmm. and photographed and there was a slew of books on Cuba that came out photographic books and I thought oh, you know I don't want to be one of I, I, I like Dolly said I don't want to be one of uh, a million and you know I wanted to and uh, I kind of put the work away and this last year uh, there's been a lot of interest in it there was a book done I'll have to send it to you but three bodies of work and one was a Cuban Mm-hmm. There were a couple of shows. Something else happened. Oh, there was a show in uh, Amsterdam of the work. Um, wild. And I went back to it. And I do like the work a lot. Uh, it was the where I separate maybe a little bit from wh- what the others were doing was I only photographed along the Malacan, the seawall of uh, Havana. And um, it's about a five-mile stretch if people don't know the Malacan and, um, and that it's kind of a document of the Malacan, mm-hmm. you know? And so it's not all of Cuba or all of Havana. It's just, mm-hmm. it's exactly. kind of targeted. Right. Well, I like it. Um, Good. 
<laughs> I do too. <laughs> you also mentioned that you did a lot of racing photographs. And again, I, um, I'm a horse lover. So this was one that I automatically was drawn to too. So, <laughs> yeah, when I was, uh, someone in fact in the, uh, um, answer, but, um, Harry Callahan was my teacher, uh, one of them photo teacher. And, um, at one point I said to Harry in this kind of student-y way, <laughs> um, uh, what can I photograph? You know, I was kind of stuck. And he said, well, what, what do you like to do besides take pictures? And I said, well, I like uh, to listen to country music <laughs> and I like to uh, go to the races and bet on the races, horse racing. And he said, well, why don't you photograph that stuff? And I said, Are you, it sounded cheap to me, you know, superficial or I was supposed to photograph trees or something, <laughs> landscape, I don't know. And, um, I said, really? I can do that? He said, yeah. He said, shoot what you love. He said, you know, if even if you make bad pictures, you'll have a good time. Mm. So I thought, yeah, that's okay. And I've kind of done, that's what I've kind of tried to follow as much as I could. Well, it's past. appropriate that you just said that, Henry, because the very last one that I pulled up shoot, was the shoot what you love. Shoot what you love, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that's interesting. Um <laughs> Yeah, these pictures were taken for different things. Shoot What You Love is, uh, is my memoir, I guess, my, um, my first 50 years. Um, but, and it is, I, you know, feature a lot of different uh, stories that I shot. The one on the left is called We Sorts. It's about uh, a triracial community in central Maryland uh, that's really not ever been written about um, uh, a friend of mine is a wee sort. She's from there and she's doing a book or she says she is. Leslie, if you're out there, but I only, I had an email with her yesterday and it seems like she's actually making progress, which is fabulous. Um, so we did this together. It's really her book and my pictures are, you know, uh, ancillary to that. And uh, that picture on top is a picture from a Library of Congress series I did in 1979, the state of Rhode Island for the Library of Congress and something called the American Folklife Center. Yes. And you probably had some connection with them or dealings with them, I imagine. But they did these oral histories. And this one was in Rhode Island and I was the photographer on the team. Uh, Kyle Fleischauer, another photographer who swims in our waters, um, had hired me to do that. And the bottom one was uh, uh, a, pro a book I did in 2010, I think. But I, during the beginning of the uh, 2000s, I photographed burlesque, mm -hmm. uh, drag performers, um, people who were doing alternative performance, one mm -hmm. sort or another. And I did a book called Show and uh, uh, a body of work on that, which I I, I like that work quite a bit. Uh, it's not for everybody, but um, uh, but what, what was funny about it is uh, my, my, I don't know if it's my favorite show, but one of my favorite shows of that work was at the O. Winston Link Museum in Roanoke, Virginia, okay. uh, which is, uh, O. Winston Link was a great train photographer and it was an old train station. Okay. That they made into a, a beautiful museum. Um, yeah. That's so a, a couple of, of hours up the road from us. So, yeah, it's really a beautiful museum, and uh, but they because it has um, uh, rated R material, I would say uh, they had to put a you know um, a caution on the on the on the, uh, on the door saying you know discretionary, right? You know, for kids and everything. So I thought that's surprising they would have it, but. I was excited. Well, that brings us to the end of, and I'm going to stop sharing for now. Um, that brings us to the end of the conversation part of this. Um, I'm going to hand over to Scotty, who's going to go th work through some of the chat questions with you. Um, but thank you so much. That was fascinating. I could have talked so much more and I actually did skip over some of our questions. So maybe we'll have to have a second conversation. At some we'll point. do it again. We'll do it again. Or when I come down to visit. Yes. Uh, I can't wait to do that. So I'm, I'm handing over to my colleague, Scotty Almany. Um, 
and and I'll let him take over with the questions. All right. So we we do have a few that popped up in the chat. Um, the first one is about the location. Um, it's from John Bouchard. Um, where is Reed's Ferry? Um, he's from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he's never heard of it. Well, I answered him, but I'll, I'll tell you, uh, Reed's Ferry doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so that may be why uh, John had never heard of it. But it's right near, it's on Route 3A. It was on Route 3A near Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, it, I think it was originally Reed's Ferry. It was a place where they had ferries that went across, you know, it, that was very rural um, probably still is, uh, but the Manchester was a, um, uh, a factory town. So they may have needed the ferries to, you know, ferry whatever they produced uh, in, Reed's Fer in uh, Manchester. I don't know the history of it there, but I, I know it doesn't exist anymore, at least not on the map or on the Google, but you can look it up and you can find, probably find that information. Yeah, it's interesting um, to think of some places that just aren't there anymore or have changed names. Yeah, yeah. So the next one is kind of a comment, but a bit of a question there. It's from Anthony DeLuca, um, and he says, Henry, what about the mortality and humanity of these folks? The stories of the John Primes, Billy Joe Shavers, Jerry Jeff Walkers um, in photography. Is there a need for that? Rodney Crowell has a song it ain't over yet about Guy and Susanna Clark um, and we are losing these folks and we definitely are more rapidly all the time well no doubt and it's uh, you know who's going to fill these shoes that song too you know there are songs about about that um, I have to say you know I've loved John Prine Jerry jo Jeff Walker and so forth Rodney Crowell as well, a guy, Clark, Susanna Clark. Um, this is the kind of music I love. I love Texas country music, uh, particularly these days. Um, but the Billy Joe Shaver one was really the one that destroyed me, I have to say. I saw him perform many times, and I followed him, um, and follow him formally, but um, every few months or weeks even, sometimes I check his website, hoping he was going to come to Boston or New York. I went to see him in New York a couple of times, just went to New York to see him. And um, I have a picture I kind of like of him. If I do another edition of this book, it'll be in that, uh, you know. Uh, he was a very humble guy, I thought, you know, and, and a brilliant songwriter. Not all his songs were great, but uh, he had so much heart. And, um, I saw John Prine on his first tour out of Chicago and when he first came up with Steve Goodman, folk singer that uh, wrote City of New Orleans, I believe. And uh, they came and played in a folk club in Boston called um, the Club 47. It's now called Passim. Jerry Jeff, I saw for the first time at the Philadelphia Folk Festival in 1968. He had not moved to Austin yet. Uh, David Bromberg, the folk singer, guitarist, uh, was backing him up, and he had only recently written um, uh, Mr. Bojangles, and I did. he did perform that. with. Uh, yeah, I always liked him, too, and I know that he just passed away. Yeah. <laughs> Has it even been a month yet? No, just about maybe a month or... Yeah. Um, yeah, I loved, his, I loved his music, too, and, and a very heartfelt... You know, I think towards the end, maybe a little less so, but probably a lot of people got that way. Billy Joe, you know, the last time I saw him was maybe two years ago, and he was just the same. You know, he just let it all out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know what to do. I mean, we're losing them. Are there people who are replacing them? Probably, you know, on some level. Uh, but the thing about all those people is um, – they didn't start out with videos and they didn't start out with, you know, managers and uh, marketing people. And uh, they started out with uh, small shows and, 
you know, playing in other people's bands. And people still do that, of course, you know. But then there are people who, and I won't name names, but, um, you know, who kind of like, um, you know, s- started out with a lot of advantages. Um, and all those people uh, Anthony mentions are people who really worked. John Prine was a um, postman for a long time, a mail deliverer, delivered the mail. Um, Billy Joe, you know, did a lot of crazy things, I think. And Jerry Jeff was from New York, New York State. He wasn't from Texas, but he went down there and became uh, him and, I guess, um, uh, Willie Nelson became the face of Texas country music. Yeah, I remember. What was Billy Joe's son's name? Was it Eddie Shaver? Eddie Shaver, yeah. I remember when he passed. Um, I liked their stuff together um, pretty right. well. So. A little more rock and roll. When, uh, but, you know, he, what, what I loved about Billy Joe Shaver was when he played with people, he let them have their head. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that – I don't think it was that he was – Eddie was his son, maybe a little bit, but I think it was like, Eddie, you're a great guitarist. You do your thing. You know, yeah, that's and, cool. and I really think that that's the way he was. You know? As far as Texas stuff, I'm a big Doug Som fan, too. Oh, got to be, yeah. <laughs> so we got a couple more. So this one is from um, Elizabeth, I think it's Rowan. Um, speaking of Kickstarter t-shirts, she wants a second Honky Tonk t-shirt, <laughs> first of all. And she'll buy whatever else she put up. But, <laughs> but her question sure you'll, you'll regret what you're saying uh. <laughs> but her question is um, how studying with Aaron Siskin and Harry Callahan influenced your portraits well um, I don't know if they influenced my portraits either of them they weren't really portrait photographers Harry a little bit with his wife's pictures of his wife I guess but um, they both influenced me enormously as you know as teachers and um they were very different Aaron was um Aaron was your judgmental father (laughs) he always had an opinion about what you should do but it was always you know well meant you know he was on your side and so was Harry Uh, but Harry was the opposite Harry was like do work hard (laughs) do you know good work and I got to go out and have a sig now, you know. <laughs> he didn't talk as much as Aaron did. But, um, but what I really got from them, and this sound, may sound crazy to people, you know, today, which definitely sound crazy to my students, but in those days, there were very few people, very few photographers who did what they did, which is they did personal work, and they taught for a living. And that was, a, today, that's a, a well-trod career path. There's a million graduate students who are trying to do the same thing now. But in those days, there were only about eight graduate schools in photography, the whole country. And, um, and Callahan and Siskin and a few others were the ones who pioneered that career path. And... Um, and that's how they really influenced me. I thought, I looked at their lives. I said, they're teaching and I love that. And they're doing their own thing and they don't have a boss. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good life to me. And that's what I set out to do. I mean, I don't think I was that strategic, but that is what I set out to do. And I, um, uh, before Harry died, he had an exhibit at the uh, National Gallery in Washington. And I went down to go to the opening of it. I just went on my own. Um, And there were like 20 or 25 of his students there who did the same thing, who went on their own to go to this show. We weren't invited. We just went, you know, we found out about it and went. And um, every one of them was a teacher at a university. And so they, I think, also thought the way I did. So he influenced my he influenced my career and my way of thinking of a life. So it was bigger than just my portraits. So yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Oh no, I just said that that says a lot about him um, for sure. So. Yeah, sure did. 
Yeah. Um, Give me swagger. Awesome. You're right, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, John Bouchard has another question. Um, have you ever taken photos of Iris Dement? Uh, um, I think you missed one, James McMurtry with Anthony, but uh, I never photographed Iris Dement. Um, I wish I had. She's a favorite of mine. Um, and um, I love that song where she sings with her mother in the Grand Ole Opry and, you know, she talks about how her her mom would listen to the Grand Ole Opry and she has her mom singing with her. Um, and she, with John Prine too, she has that terrific song with John Prine. Um, God, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I, I could sing it if I could sing. Um, but... Um, yeah, so I never photographed her, no. Uh, I was at her first, <laughs> her first, um, I think it was her first national tour. It must have been. Uh, she came to, came to Somerville, Massachusetts and opened for Roy oh God, Bookbender. It's a Bookbinder. Blues, uh, Bookbinder, right, sorry. Uh, blues guitar, she opened for him. And we have a radio show, which I'll promote now <laughs> in uh, Boston. Some of you know, uh, it's called Hillbilly at Harvard, WHRB, Harvard Radio. And it's been going since the late 1940s. And, um, and those guys found out about Iris Dement. They, in those days, the DJs at that station really had their uh, finger on the pulse. And they said, there's this Iris Dement. We got the album. It's fabulous. You ought to go out and see her. You know, they didn't like folk music, so they didn't care about Roy. But they, uh, you ought to go out and see her. And um, the place was packed for Iris Dement. And then when she was finished, half of them left. Half of the crowd left. So I guess people were listening to Hillbilly at Harvard. And she was wonderful. And she must have been terrified. <laughs> yeah, that's... But I didn't photograph her. I wish I had. Sometimes the openers are, are the ones to see. <laughs> and Anthony yeah. mentioned that was a comment about the Dale Watson photo with the Jimmy Swagger um, mm -hmm. comment, but he does have one more question um, about Dave Van Ronk, uh, mayor of McDougal Street. Does that sound, does that ring a bell? His name does for me, for sure. Yeah, Dave Van Ronk, sure. I've saw him, saw him many times. Um, he was a um, folk singer, blues singer from... Uh, uh, I don't know where he was from, but he um, he plied his trade in Greenwich Village in New York. He was there when Bob Dylan came, and um, they um, you know there's million legends, and who knows what's really true. But they definitely knew each other, and he was considered a bit of a mentor to, to Dylan. Uh, that movie, um, the Cone Brother movie, looking for uh, inside of Lou and Davis, maybe. Inside, yeah, inside Lou and Davis. They say that the the main character was somewhat based on Dave Van Ronk. I don't know if it's true. I think it was probably a combination of people. But I think uh, I heard that too. You did, yeah. I think so. They also, sorry. I think so. Yeah. They also said it was partly a guy named Paul Clayton, who was actually from New Bedford, Massachusetts, who was a folk singer in the same era and a friend of Dylan's Rolling Thunder review and guy. And, um, he, um, uh, he, he supposedly taught Dylan a lot of the early, he was a folklorist, uh, Paul Clayton. So he taught him a lot of the traditional music, uh, supposedly. Um, someone said, uh, yeah, Dave and Ron's very good. I, uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> um, Dave and Ronk, when he was sick at the end of his life, uh, they had a, um, a benefit concert for him because he was broke, I'm sure. And, uh, to pay his medical bills. And it was at the bottom line, which was a coffee house in near New York university, NYU in New York. And, um, the lineup was folk singer named Tom Paxton. Um, uh, Arlo Guthrie, uh, another folk singer, and Peter, Paul, and Mary. Those were the three acts, and it was 50 bucks, I remember, you know, because it was a benefit, so it was an expensive ticket in those days. And um, I remember um, 
<laughs> um, it, they had these long tables, and Mary Travers of Peter Paul and Mary sat across from where I was sitting, and um, uh, she was knocking them back a bit, I got to say. And uh, <laughs> Arlo Guthrie started um, uh, saying, "I'm going to play this song by Elizabeth Cotton." Da 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 da. And um, Mary Travers said, "Freight train, I hate that." effing song and under her breath kind of, but I could hear it. And she ran up to the bar to, you know, calm down. And then a few songs later they were on and everything. And she was like, if I had a hammer, you know, and it's like this really upbeat song and, uh, you know, showbiz, Dave and rock. He died a few, uh, interesting people were there. Um, you know, some movie stars who liked Dave and Rock's music, I guess. And, um, Anthony also asked about James McMurtry, um, and he did. He played the Continental Club upstairs, I think, sometimes. They had a little place upstairs as well as a, a, a bigger venue downstairs. Um, and I love James McMurtry. I don't know if you guys uh, hear him very much or how much he gets played, but uh, his father was Larry McMurtry, of course, who great um, uh, novelist of the West. And, um, uh, but I had one thing in common with James McMurtry, uh, aside from liking his music was we had the same lawyer, <laughs> just kind wow. of weird. <laughs> his lawyer was in Boston, even though he was from Austin or from Texas anyway. And, uh, uh, one day I went to see him at this club in Somerville, Mass., Johnny D's, and to, I went to see McMurtry, and I saw my lawyer there, sitting out there in the audience. And I went up to him and I said, "Hey," he said, "Oh yeah, I'm James's lawyer too." So, <laughs> so we shared a lawyer. Yeah, that's cool. So <laughs> we had one more pop up, and we'll do that one, and that's it, and we'll start wrapping up. But I wanted to do this one just because I'm a big Alejandro Escobedo and Leonard, Leonard Cohen fan. So, but um, what do you think of the neighbors? Uh, to the south and the north, Mexico and Canada, Gordon Lightfoot, Linda Ronstadt, um, and then Alejandro Escovito and Leonard Cohen. Well, amazing, of course. I mean, of all of them, um, uh, I think Lightfoot, to me, um, and particularly Linda Ronstadt. And um, I remember, I saw her a couple of times early on, um, I saw her in a show, the doors opened for her band, the Stone Ponies. Yeah. And um, they had a couple of hits and, um, and the doors were just starting out. So, you know, and um, that was pretty weird. And then when she left the Stone Ponies, she had a country act. She recorded a couple of amazing country. I, a lot of you people know this, I know, but... Um, I'm just rambling on a couple of albums from Capitol Records, two of my favorite albums still, the Linda Ronstadt's country albums, because she can sing anything. But um, And I went up to see her at a little club. She was touring for the albums called um, Something on the Highway. God, I can't remember. Sandy, someone was the, the owner of it. And it was a jazz club normally. But uh, Linda Ronstadt did a night or two, and I got to see her in a small club with a small band, and it was really incredible. But, yeah. Um, Leonard Cohen, I mean, they're, you know, the music, all of that music is great, roots music. Alejandro, Leonard. Um, yeah, I like Alejandro's stuff. You know, a lot of people don't know, but he started in, like, the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s punk scene in California. Oh, did he? I didn't know that, yeah. And he had a band called Rank and File, um, and then they kind of progressed more toward root stuff, and, you know, he, he's just done a lot of stuff. He's, he's a great musician, too. He must have come up with Dave Alvin, did he? Oh, must yeah, the Blasters. That. Uh, yeah, a lot of those punkers are now country artists, I notice. <laughs> oh, yeah. And and, you know, people like that. <laughs> Definitely a lot of them, especially from California, it seems like. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Um, that's well, cool. uh, that's all of our questions. Thanks for, thanks for answering everyone. And I'll turn it back over to Renee to start wrapping things up. And it was good talking to you. And yeah, we'll see you, uh, in the spring or 
winter, spring, I think, Scotty. Yeah, I'm looking, so. looking forward to we'll it. Have a little party and invite the people who have survived this yeah. conversation. I'm, I'm so up for that and ready. <laughs> well, Henry, that was wonderful. I mean, like I said, we could have talked much longer and I, there were questions that I meant to ask that I didn't get a chance to, but we'll definitely have some more conversations in the future. But we'll do it. Um, let me, I'm going to share my screen one last time with everyone. Um, just to say thank you to everyone who came out tonight and who participated in this conversation with Henry Hornstein. And for those of you who shared your questions, those were great and gave us even more depth to the, to the conversation. Thank you very much for supporting the Birthplace of Country Music's programming. We really appreciate that. And we do have some forward programming that you might be interested in. And I've put them up here on the screen. Um, on Thursday, November 19th at 11 a.m., you can listen to Radio Bristol's Radio Bristol Book Club's discussion about Woman Walk the Line, How the Women of Country Music Changed Our Lives. Um, also on Thursday, night, November 19th at 7 p.m. On, on the Radio Bristol Facebook Live site, you can watch um, the November Foreman Fun Time radio show, um, which is broadcast and videoed live. Tuesday, November 24th at 4 p.m., we are um, using our Smithsonian Affiliates status to share pandemic perspectives, comfort food during a pandemic, which is appropriate during the week of Thanksgiving. Wednesday, November 25th at 11 a.m. on our museum Facebook page, you can have a holiday story time with Summer and Tony, where they'll be doing a couple of folk tales um, with sound effects and um, just the art of storytelling. And then finally, on, at, on Thursdays at 11 a.m., tune in to Radio Bristol for more time with Renee and Scotty, with me and Scotty, as we do our museum talk radio show every week. Um, all of those are some great ways to interact with the museum. We'll have a lot more coming up in the coming months. So go onto our website, um, subscribe to our newsletter, because we're going to have lots of virtual programming. So even if you're not on our doorstep, you can be part of what we are doing. And I am sure we will have some more stuff coming up about Henry Hornstein's exhibit, Honky Tonk Portraits of Country Music, and other things going forward. But again, thank you for being here with us. Most importantly, thank you, Henry, for being here with us. Thank you, Renee Scotty, and the rest of you. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs>